Good morning to you. How are you all this morning? I hope it's a happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Roseville Adventist Church. We're glad that you're here. You may know that we've been having a wonderful seminar, a Bible seminar presented by Dr. Woodson. And Doc, we just want to say thank you again. We're glad that you're here to present uh, a concluding, crescendoing finale for us to this Bible seminar. And we're grateful to also have had Melody here. She's here again singing honoring the Lord. And I want to thank each one of you that have been here working, praying, behind the scenes, doing a lot of different things to help this uh, Bible seminar uh, work well. And I just want to say thank you as your pastor. Uh, Dan, I also want to say a special thank you to the lights. If you notice some lights behind me, it looks really nice, does it not? Yes. Thank you, Dan, very much. And there's birthdays today. There's someone behind me that has a birthday. Someone behind me has a birthday. I won't say any names. Anybody else have a birthday this morning? Any other birthdays this morning? Well, happy birthday to you if you're a little bit shy and don't want to raise your hand. We're happy you're here. You may see an instrument behind me, a little wooden box that's called a cajon. That's going to help us keep a little bit of time during our praise team worship portion of our service. Uh, you may have noticed in your weekly uh, announcements that you get. If you don't, you can subscribe to our news points. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we have some different things going on. One of them is tomorrow, SAA is having a special constituency meeting. If you're a delegate, please don't forget that starts at 10 a.m. Also, uh, don't forget we encourage wearing masks. It's not a mandate, uh, but if uh, you're willing to do so, we encourage that. And tomorrow, the Placerville Church is hosting a Cars in Christ car meet. That's from 1 to 3, and there's Mexican food there for purchase. And at 3 p.m., Steve Errington will share his story of redemption. Also today we have a second reading for a couple people coming to our church and we want to welcome you officially. Elizabeth Villalpando from the Brownwood Church and Janet Moss from the Van Nuys Church. Can we get a hearty welcome and amen and thank you that you are at our church. Okay. Is there a motion to accept these names into our fellowship? Is there a second? All in favor say amen. amen. Thank you Jesus. Amen. Today for our service we have a special service as you know. We are tying off our Bible seminar entitled, What on Earth Am I Doing Here? Yes. So today we have uh, Lanny doing the children's story. Paul will be presenting uh, the offering. We have a praise team up here with Brian and Doris in the back and myself. Uh, the dean will bring us to scripture and the prayer. And yours truly, not me, Dr. Woodson, will be here presenting the word of God. But before that, Melody will again be fulfilling her namesake bringing us melodies from on high. God bless you. Let's have a word of prayer and ask for God's blessing on our service. Lord, we're thankful that you love us. We, we're thankful that you have a purpose and a plan. We thank you that in your eyes we're beautiful, that we're masterpieces, that we're royalty, Lord, that you've designed us not to be alone, to be together with others and with you. Lord, I pray today that you would bless us again in a special way during this service, and may the name of Jesus be exalted. May we walk out better than we walked in. And may the name of Jesus be written again on our hearts. We ask for your spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Where are our kids? I'm usually with them in Sabbath school these days. Come, collect the dollars for our worthy students.
Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad to see you here today. I'll give you another minute to get them in there. You can put them more than one at a time. It works. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> That's what I'd be doing, would be counting them. Well, Jesus, we're thankful for every one of those, for the kids at our schools. Come, you're welcome up here. I might need you for answers today. If you've heard very many of my children's stories, you've already guessed that I like animals. And I especially like big animals. When my husband and I bought our home outside of Auburn, California, we were off of Highway 49, just barely tucked over a little hill, and there was a big, there was not a big, but there was a valley. And it was full of little farms and ranches. We had 10 acres there. Imagine my surprise when the second day I looked out and from my dining room window, I saw not one, not two or three, not four. There were five big of these creatures. I'll bet one of you knows who these are. What is, what is this kind of animal? Yes. It's an American bison. And the daddy bison can be as tall as eight feet at the shoulder. I've never seen them much over six, but they get massive and they weigh like 2,000 pounds. These are huge, big animals. And where do they normally live? Not California. They live in the prairie states. They live out there in Wyoming and Montana and Yellowstone National Park. Those bison were in my little valley. And I was so excited. I called my husband and said, you'll never guess who our new neighbors are. And, and he's going, well, he said, all right, I can't guess who are our new neighbors. I said, we have bison out the window. Now, I had two big dogs. And I go, now, puppies, when you go visiting, Cody especially liked to visit cows. I said, don't you go near those bison. Mama cannot retrieve you from the bison. <laughs> so the dogs had strict orders. They weren't supposed to go that direction if they ever ran off. But we loved watching the bison. Almost every day we'd see one or two. The reason there were bison in this valley up out of Auburn is because the owners had a beautiful, big mating pair that they would loan to zoos. And sometimes they got lent to um, Yellowstone Park to make sure that the genetic pool of the animals, that they'd all stay really healthy. So we didn't have the biggest ones at the farm all the time, but they would show up and, oh, it was interesting. They would, they had just a few bison here in California. Then in Eastern Oregon, they had a big ranch with lots of them. So one morning, Andrew comes to my room and he goes, oh, mom. There's something wrong with the dogs. And I go, the dogs, both of them? Couldn't imagine something would affect both of them at the same time. He said, they won't go outside. And I go, well, that doesn't sound at all like my dogs. So I went to a different door than the one Andrew let them out all the time. And I stepped out onto the deck. And the minute I opened the door, the dogs stepped back. They were not going to get tricked into going out that door. So I stepped out onto the deck and I started looking. And you know what? I didn't see any cows. And I looked over to our neighbor that often had a horse or two. There were no horses out. And then I listened. I wasn't even hearing the birds this morning. What was going on? And then I heard it. There was a teenage bison had come in late last night. They had a big semi truck with a huge trailer. They had brought this teenager to the farm and that morning, he had decided he was going to single-handedly remove all the fences in the valley and throw a big party. So he's out there. I'm standing on the deck two farms away. And this young teenager throws himself at the fence, and it felt like the gate shook. I mean, he was, he was just being a wild kid. And he's running around, and he's tearing up the ground and just making a ruckus. And I go, well, you know, I think the dogs had a good idea. Inside seems like the right place for mother to be. When all of a sudden I saw him at the, at the door to the barn, the big patriarch bison stepped up. 
And he did not paw the ground. He did not toss his head and make a big production. He stood there in absolute majesty. And the teenager got quiet. All that monkey business was over with. The king had stepped up, and the the teenager wasn't going to argue with him. And I go, wow, that's what it looks like in my life. When God, my king, steps up, Satan can't say a thing. Satan has to take two steps back and hush. I will never forget the lesson that the bison taught me that day. May God stand with all of us each and every day. Shall we say a short prayer? Dear Jesus, we're so thankful that you are our Savior and that we have a God that is willing to take the field for us. And our God always wins. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. I thought the kids were going to stay up here for the rest of their service. So why do we do an offering call? Why do we talk about tithe and offering every Sabbath? Um, now, I think the easy answer is that, you know, the church has bills to pay, you know, and, and this is the way that the church gets funded. But I think there's more to it than that. Um, last night, Mark, you talked about how God knows all our names. He knows everything about us. He knows the number of hairs on the top of our head. Um, He knows absolutely everything that there is to know about us. But he knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think we kind of like the the thought of, of God knowing everything that's good about us. But when we start thinking about all the the negative things in our life, that sometimes it gets a little bit uncomfortable. But God knows all the things that interfere with our relationship with him. And one of the things that probably has more impact in terms of our relationship with God is our relationship with our possessions. One of the things that you often find is that people who have a lot will always want more. And this is actually kind of um, backed up by some data, which actually comes from the federal government. And to give you an idea, um, this is the latest survey of consumer expenditures by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics found that the poorest one-fifth of American households, and if if you're in the poorest one-fifth, you do not make a lot of money, contributed an average of 4.3% of their income to charitable organizations, while the richest fifth donated 2.1% of their income. So the people that can afford it the least contribute the most, and the people that contribute the most contribute the least. So it's like the more that we have, the more that we want and the less that we want to give away. That is why we do tithe and offerings. Tithing is God's way of controlling that part of us that just wants more things from this world. That helps our relationship. It's not to fund the church. It's to help develop that relationship that we have with God. That's the reason that we do it. If you want to find one thing that you can start tomorrow that's going to have a dramatic impact in your life, start tithe and offering. Start tithing. It's a, it's, a, it's a very daunting thing to do, but I think anybody here who's done it will tell you you will find remarkable things that happen in your life. We'll be picking up the, uh, the offerings at the end of the church at the, at the back of the service on here, but let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be your children. You know everything that there is about us. You know all the things that, you know, that... Uh, we want out of this life that mess up our relationship with you we just thank you to interject and be with us and help develop that relationship we ask this in your name amen
starter of worship this morning in worship and song, we're going to be doing a song that we had just started doing before COVID. And it's not a super familiar one unless you listen to certain Christian stations. But it's based on Revelation 5. I'd like to read that to you. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open this book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou hast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and tribe and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne and unto the lamb forever and the four beasts said amen and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him that lives forever this song is is he worthy and then if you're not familiar with it you can listen and then come in as you become familiar with it. We tried playing it a little bit for the prelude so you'd hear it a little bit. But there's a response time that you can say, is he this? Yeah, he is. So you can at least do that. But think of this. The lamb that is worthy is Jesus. Amen. And we'll go right into the next song, Jesus, Holy and Anointed One.
Today's reading from the first Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 7. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagan somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. We're going to say a prayer, American 40, please kneel and uh, I'll stay close to the mic. Our Heavenly Father, it's such a great privilege to call God Almighty our Father. We're grateful for this wonderful blessing that we have Sabbath day, Sabbath rest, a peaceful time. We're so grateful for the place, cozy, friendly, always welcoming, that we can come together and worship you. There are so many people in this world who do not have this privilege. So thank you for the place and time of peace and blessing. Lord, we pray for those who experience loss in their lives and they lost their loved ones. Please be with them and comfort them and be their good shepherd who leads them through the grief. We ask for those who are fighting with illness today, our friends, brothers and sisters, some are here. Lord, you know the names and all their needs. And we pray, please, just bless them with comfort, physical, emotional, spiritual. We also want to ask you for a fresh and really inspiring prayer of life, your word. Please bless the messenger and message. We need to be, we need to hear your, your spirit and your inspiration to be renewed in faith and grace. Please bless, be with us, and help us enjoy your blessing. And we pray that in Jesus' holy name. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I'm so glad to be with you all this morning. Shining. 
Good morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Wasn't that beautiful? Yeah, it was beautiful. And we've been uh, blessed uh, with Melody singing uh, all week long. So if you weren't here uh, during this week, you really missed a wonderful treat. It's almost like we had a concert every day. It was just great. It was wonderful and uh, just just wonderful. Uh, Good to be with you again today. This has been a wonderful time together. I really have just been blessed, and I hope you've been blessed. Uh, We've had a wonderful time uh, in the Lord looking at God's Word and uh, hearing what He has to say uh, to us. And I just, again, want to thank uh, Pastor David Resendez, your pastor. Give him a hand. What What a fine pastor he is. What a fine pastor he is. And I really have appreciated him. I appreciate his leadership. I appreciate his his friendship and his servant's heart. He has a servant's heart uh, as a leader and, and a, being a servant leader, and that's a wonderful. Thank you, Pastor David. Thank you for the opportunity for, and your hospitality. And uh, also for all of you, uh, for, he mentioned that earlier, for everyone who's working the different aspects each and night right at their posts. You know, these are soldiers for the Lord. They've just been right at their posts each and every night, ready to go. And uh, I particularly want to thank our sound guys who are in the back. Uh, I was telling them, let's give them a hand too. I want to thank, I'm so grateful uh, to them. I was telling them earlier this week, I said, I've never ever uh, spoken somewhere and, uh, for a few days and never hear a squeak of the mic <laughs> or, or the mic's not on and I'm like, could you turn this on? Any of like, just smooth. Thank you guys, really. What you do it makes a difference. And, uh, and then for all of you as, as members of this church, what a wonderful church this is. Beautiful facility. You're in a good spot. And um, beautiful, beautiful uh, stained glass windows. I see the roses there for Roseville. Just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And so it has been, it has been a blessing. Um, so we have, uh, we have been in our, in our series. We have been in our series. What on earth am I doing here? What on earth am I doing here? I remember uh, it was one of the, um, I was a fairly young pastor then, and I had and decided to do something with my church I had never done before, and that was we were going to go on a mission trip. I had never taken a group of 
members from our church, and mainly these were going to be young people on this particular mission trip, and uh, we had a number of them signed up. It was with Maranatha. Anybody ever gone on a mission trip with Maranatha? Yeah, I know a number of you have. It was a Maranatha. This was one of the, it was a large group. There were about 45 that ended up coming from our church. 45, and they were like, that is a big number. We don't normally get that big of a number from one church. And this mission trip, because I thought, well, let's not go too far. Let's not go way down to Africa or way across to China. Let's go somewhere not too far and maybe not too bad. And so we decided, because they had a need to build a, a church and a school in Jamaica. That was funny because a lot of people from the church were saying, uh, that doesn't sound like a mission trip. <laughs> You're going to Jamaica. That sounds a little too fun. And we kind of thought, well, maybe it might be nice and have some fun because, you know, you've seen those wonderful pictures of Jamaica and those white sandy beaches and everything else. And we said, I hope the church that we're building is right on the beach. <laughs> well, when we got there, it was not a church that we were building on the beach. In fact, it wasn't far from Kingston, Jamaica. It was just a little bit outside of uh, that city of Kingston, Jamaica. And we were there, and we got there, and it was not the most comfortable of places. It was summertime, and it was hot. Did you all hear me say hot? It was hot, caliente. It was hot, and it was not only hot. I can handle hot, right? Sacramento is hot. Riverside, California, where I lived a long time, is hot. But this was hot and humid. Hot and humid is different. I can't take hot and humid. I went to school in the South, and I'm like, I got to get out of here. Hot and humid, right? Mel Melanie knows we went to Oakwood down in, North, down in Alabama, in cotton fields of Alabama, South. And it's hot and humid. And so it was hot and humid. And it was uncomfortable. Remember, I told you, there were young people that were on this trip. So we had a lot of young people, and they also were hot and humid. And they were sweaty. And it wasn't taking long for the aromas to start, you know, going around the bus and stuff, you know, because it was uncomfortable. So we were settling in, settling in. And, you know, if you're on a mission trip, it can't be a mission trip if you stay in a nice place. I don't know. It just goes with it. You can't be on a mission trip and stay in a hotel. And so we stayed in another church, uh, and we brought our sleeping bags. And sometimes these mission trips, you sleep in tents, right? So we, we were nice. We had a building. And we're in this building, and, um, and, uh, and we, we start putting our, setting our things up. Uh, all the girls on one side of the building and all the boys on one other side of the building, all the guys on one side of the building. And it was so hot. I mean, we thought that maybe when it got later that evening, it would cool off, right? We thought maybe we'd get some of those Jamaican ocean breezes. That was not the case. It was hot and humid. Did I say it was hot? It was hot and humid. And we're sitting there, we're like, it's not cooling off. So we decided the right thing to do was we've got to leave the windows open. We've got to leave the windows open because it's hot. And so we left the windows open and... Um, that was, turned out to be not a good idea. Turned out not to be a good idea. Because I can tell you, there were Jamaican mosquitoes that had a feast on us Americans. And I think they loved that Taco Bell blood because <laughs> they were just sucking it up. And I mean, we were just covered. And, and I mean, the first night, so... It was just like, oh, my goodness. I mean, the mosquitoes were so bad. I felt so bad. I was scared to bring the kids home after this trip because the mosquitoes were so bad. It distorted even some of the way the kids looked. It was so bad. And I remember the first night, it was bad enough, right? And then the second night, and I remember sitting there. I'm in my sleeping bag. It's so hot. And I'm thinking, okay, I've got a choice here. Either I'm going to get eaten alive or I'm just going to be hot in my sleeping bag. And I'm just miserable. Everybody's miserable. And I'm sitting on a concrete floor. And I'm thinking about my wonderful bed at home. <laughs> Ever been like that, right? And as I'm sitting there, I'm saying, what on earth am I doing here? Whose idea was this to go on this mission trip? What on earth am I doing here? here. And as I sat there in my sleeping bag, hearing the mosquitoes buzzing, <laughs> he
hearing people wailing. <laughs> I thought, we're here because we have a purpose. God has called us to this place. It's not by accident. We are here for a purpose. And that was to build a church in honor of Jesus Christ. And when we were brought back to recognizing our purpose, the mosquitoes, they were bad, but we found a way to get through it. It was hot, but we found a way to get through it. We had jokes and everything else that went along with it. We found ways to cope because even though it was a horrible situation for us, our first mission trip, we were there for a purpose. That's what we've been talking about this week. That's what we've been talking about this week. We started out by asking the question, and it's four, three or four questions that we've been asking. First night was, who am I? And we discovered that, that we were purposefully de uh, designed. God had a purpose for each and every one of us, and he designed us in a very special way. We were not made by accident. We learned that we were God's masterpiece, his works of art. From Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which has been our, our main theme this week, that we are God's masterpiece. We are his handiwork um, created. And, and, and because God designed us, he, he had a very special purpose for us. He actually planned us for his pleasure. And we said, well, when you talk about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength, that really is worship. That's what worship is all about. So God planned us for worship. God planned us to be in relationship with him uh, individually. Each of us, he planned us to be in relationship. And then we asked the question on Thursday night, who do I look like? Who do I look like? And we discovered we were made in God's image, in his likeness, transformed. God is even transforming us because sin did a distortion on us. Sin were like those mosquitoes. It distorted us, tore us up. And it transformed. God is now transforming us. He's restoring us to look just like Jesus in character. He's working on that. And it's a process that he goes through in life. And then last night we talked about where do I belong? Where do I belong? Well, we all belong to someone. We were created for community. We were created not to be in isolation, not to be separate, not to live as hermits. We were actually created the very, our very way, the very way God designed us was to be in relationship. Not only with him, we talked about the vertical relationship last night, but then the relationship we have with one another. And both relationships are important. Come on and say amen to that. Both relationships are important. And just so that, and these all things, these work together, right, by the way, because these relationships are so important, God puts us in community because community actually also helps form our characters. Do you realize that? That's why when two people get married, it helps your character. Well, it should help your character. You know, because you know a long time before, uh, I've told you, I uh, told this group before, if you're just joining us, uh, that it, it was a while before I got married uh, to the wife... Uh, to my wonderful wife, uh, Marlene. It was a long time before I got married. And I can tell you that I thought I was perfect before I got married. Anybody? You thought you were perfect before you got married, right? I mean, you thought that. I mean, you didn't say it, but, you know, psychologically, emotionally, you thought your stuff was together. And then I got married, and she was like, uh, why do you do that? Because I, I was like, because that's what I always do. She said, do you know that's crazy? Right? I mean, so that's why you need relationships, right? You need community because you have, you have blind spots, right? I've got blind spots. And guess what? You've got blind spots. And, and then some of us have rough edges, right? We have rough edges. They need to be smoothed out a little bit, right? And it takes, sometimes your kids will help smooth out some of those rough edges, <laughs> Right? Right? Uh, grandparents love that part. They're like, ooh, I can't wait till my kids have kids because they're going to get what, they, what I got, and boy, I can't wait. And grandparents, that's why grandparents smile so much. Have you ever realized that? That's why they smile so much because they're like, oh, I can't wait. Look at them. They're just, just like you, just like you, you're getting it. <laughs> right? And smooth out relationships, relationships. They smooth us out. So God intended that for us. 
And so we remember that text that said it was not good for the man to be alone. And that doesn't just mean a male. That means human beings. If you're left to your own devices, you'll do crazy things. It's just true. And so God says, no, you've been created for community. Somebody say community. Community. And we know the wonderful, most blessed community are the body of believers, the people of Jesus Christ who believe, who, who are focused, who are walking in the same direction, who arm in arm, they are the family of God. We were born to belong. We were born to belong. So today we're going to wrap up. And we're going to talk today uh, about what should I be doing? What should I be doing? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given to us in uh, reminding us who we are, being able to worship you, being able to be in relationship with you as we are in relationship to one another. Thank you, God, for that. Now, we ask again that you would speak your words. Speak through your servant today. We all are listening. And may we be able to answer life's questions that come from our heart, that come from our soul, come from our spirit. May we be answers. May we receive answers and know that every answer is in your word. Every answer is found in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in Christ's name. Amen. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. I don't know if your parents ever said that. Mine did all the time. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. I learned as a kid growing up. Uh, when my parents were asking, what were you doing? I always, I learned, it took me a while, but I learned to always be doing something. Because if I wasn't doing something, they had work for me to do, <laughs> right? So I learned. So I think over time, I just learned how to be busy because I can hear my mom saying, an idle hands are the devil's workshop. And she would say, what should you be doing right now? What should you be doing right now? And I think that's also part of life too. What should we be doing as part of the family of God? What shall we be doing? Well, let's go back to our text that has been our theme text all week. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, For we are God's, what everybody? We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's handiwork. And another word for handiwork we discovered is what? Masterpiece. Yeah, if you walk away with anything, don't forget that you and I are created. We are God's masterpiece. We are God's works of art. If you look at the original language in the Greek, it is the same root word that we get the word poem. And that is poetry. We are God's work of art. We are his creation. So you must turn to the person next to you or close to you and say, guess what? I'm a masterpiece. Yeah, say, I'm a masterpiece. I'm a masterpiece. I'm a masterpiece, all right? So we are God's masterpiece. We are God's works of art. We are unique. We're going to talk about that uniqueness, how unique we are as God's handiwork. We are created in Christ Jesus, and that's where our image is, right? We are that masterpiece. We are created in Christ Jesus. That means we're going to one day look like Christ. He's working on our characters. And also being in Christ Jesus means that we are in Christ's body, which is his church. Isn't this a wonderful text? It just packs so much into one thing. This is our purpose. Our purpose is found in this text. We are created in Christ Jesus, and it doesn't stop there. It also then lets us know what our purpose is. We are created in Christ Jesus. We reflect Christ Jesus, but also we are to do what? Huh? Yeah. We are created in Christ Jesus to look like Christ Jesus with the character of Jesus, but to do good works. Hmm. We are made, it gives us purpose, and these good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. These good works. God, think about that. God prepared these good works for you and for me. He prepared them ahead of time. Say, oh. 
when I first read this, not when I first read this text, but one time I was in my devotional time reading this text, and I, and, you know, I've read this text before because, you know, in verse 8 and 9, which is not showing up here, that is that real text that says, for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And, and man, those, that's a powerful text, right? And then verse 10 comes, or it also says, uh, w- without works, lest any man should boast. It's not about that. And then verse 10 comes next, and it's easy to read past verse 10 because t- 8 and 9 are so powerful. 8 and 9 are the gospel, Right? Eight and nine of the gospel, and it's easy to get past verse 10. But one day I'm reading in my devotion, and I get to verse 10, and I'm like, whoa! Have you ever had that when you're reading the Bible in your own dev- devotional life, and you've read a text that you've read before, and you're like, I've never noticed that before. And that's what happened when I read this. When you think about it, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That means there are some things that you have not done yet that God already prepared for you to do them. Whoa, that blew my mind when I first read that. I see it didn't have the same effect on you. I can see that it didn't have the same effect. It had that effect on me, but I can see it didn't have that effect on you. That God prepared in advance for us to do ahead of time. So there are some things that you've done in the past, but there are some things that you haven't done yet that God is preparing because that's the way he is, right? He, he has everything under control. He's got his purposes. He has his plans. And you and I learn how to be a part of his plan. Can you say amen if that makes sense? We learn to be a part of his plan. There was an old uh, gentleman by the name of, uh, I'll never forget it, it was uh, Elder Mosley. Elder Mosley. Uh, he was so old you didn't even call him by his first name. Elder C.E. Mosley. That's when they used the initials. Anybody old enough to remember ministers use their initials? They didn't, you didn't use, yes? You didn't, you're not that old, are you? Yeah, the, yeah they use it. C.E. Mosley. And by this time, while I was in school at, uh, at Oakwood College, which I told you was one of the best schools in the world, um, he, he <laughs> I'm biased. He, um, he, by that time, was retired. And, but he was still um, walking the campus. He was still one of the elders at the church. And he was, um, how do I say this? Um, he was from the old school. Um, he, I think he, I, I used to think he only had one suit because every time he always just wore a black suit. And so I thought that was the only clothes he had. But then I realized he had like 20 black suits. I mean, so he was kind of a dour kind of a, you know, and you would say, hey, Elder Mosley, because he'd walk the campus, and you know, you got students, and we'd say, hey, Elder Mosley, how you doing? He would just kind of wave and keep going, keeping his head down. But there was something he used to say that I never quite understood, and I thought he was kind of crazy. He would say, I would say, Elder Mosley, how are you doing? He said, I'm just doing my best to cooperate. (laughs) And I said, this guy is not only old, he's strange. He's weird. I mean, every day, Elder Mosley, how you doing? Just doing my best to cooperate. And it took me a while, and I had a conversation with some of his family members, because I dare not approach him. <laughs> had a conversation with his family members, and I began to understand what he was trying to say. He had, learned, he had lived long enough to understand that God had a plan, and he was not trying to mess up God's plan by getting in the way. Hello, somebody. I finally learned that because so many times I've gotten in God's way, and he says, no, no, I'm just trying to cooperate. I'm trying to be with the plan. God has a plan. He's prepared in advance for you and me to do, and I'm just doing my best to try to cooperate in the plan. Anybody want to just cooperate with what God is doing? Yeah, I just want to cooperate. I don't want to get in the way. I don't want to mess things up. Good works, good works, good works. Good works are also, if you're, if you're writing in your Bible, some people still write in their Bibles, you can put uh, next to good works the idea. Good works also mean ministry or acts of service. Mm-hmm. Ministry or acts of service is what we mean by good works. Now, it's so interesting that Ephesians 2, and, uh, Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 come before verse 10 because Ephesians verse 8 and 9 let us know that good works are not the things that saves us. Are you with me? Ephesians 2, 8, that's why it comes before verse 10. 
because you don't want you to get it twisted because people get that twisted. They think, I got to work my way in heaven. I got to work, 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 so God will be pleased with me, and then I'll make it. No. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not in of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not works lest any man should boast. That's why that's there in verse 8 and 9. So that when you get to verse 10, you recognize that he's created you to do those good works, not for you to be saved, but because you already are saved. Are you with me on that? You don't work your way into heaven. No, you are already destined for heaven, so you work. You're already saved, so you serve. See, some people get that like, oh, I'm just so saved, and I'm sanctified, and I'm glad, and I'm happy, and then they just kind of sit down. Nope. Nope, nope. You are saved to serve. You've been given salvation now to do something about it, to reflect Jesus in all of his works. And so you do ministry. Why? Because you're just now becoming like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the gospel, that's service. That is sacrifice. And so good works are ministry or service. That's what that is. Now, this is a text that we kind of looked at a little bit last night, but we looked at it in a different place. It's in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And um, in verses uh, 4 through 7, it was also read for our scripture uh, today. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to say that God has gifted his people, his followers, those who are in the body, those who are belonging. He's given us different kinds of ministries and different kinds of services so that we can be a blessing to him. There are different kinds of gifts. There are different kinds of uh, of services. You see that? But the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all of them and everyone, it is the same God at work. That's powerful. The same God at work in you and whatever you do in ministry is the same God at work in me doing ministry because it's all tied together. It unifies uh, unifies us. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And then it goes on to talk about all of these different things. Now, I want to give you a number of things in which these two texts, if you go from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 4 through 12, here's what you get. Number one, you get an understanding that there are different or variety of gifts, but yet is the spirit, it's their spiritual enablements that the Holy Spirit gives. Second, they are spirit given. God is the source of them. Number three, everyone gets at least one. Are you with me so far? They're spirit-given, different kinds. Actually, you'll read in 1 Corinthians 12, you'll see all different kinds of gifts. Everyone gets at least one. And those gifts or those ministries or the variety of those things are for the common good. Now, that's a word we don't hear a lot these days because there's so much of us that think not about the common good, we think about our own good. You know, that's what's going on in the world today. We're talking about what in the, we talk about how we're in chaos right now. A lot of the chaos is because everybody is caring about themselves and not about each other. Some of the fights we're having, if you think about it, I'm not going to start calling stuff out because then you guys might start throwing stuff at me and I got to get out of here today. But I'm telling you, there's some fights that we're having and when you boil it down, it's selfishness. When you boil it down, it's I don't want to hear your opinion, here's mine. I want to get mine out. No. So the gifts are given. God knew what he was doing. God said, I'm going to give a variety of gifts for the common good, for the good of the body, for the good of the community, because we were born and we were created for community, for the good of community, not always just my right, what I want to do. And I don't care what you do because it's about me. It's about my family. It's about my stuff. No, 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 no. It's about for the common good, the body. And the Holy Spirit determines who gets what gift. The Holy Spirit determines who gets what gift. So let me tell you that you and I, we talk about we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We were shaped for serving God. We were shaped, we were designed for serving God. God created and formed every creature on this planet 
with a special area of expertise. I, I really like that children's story uh, that, I, that I heard today when I saw that, that um, I'd call it a buffalo. I know that's not the right thing you're supposed to call it. It's the American. The kids are so smart, too. I heard them say, American bison. And I was like, isn't that a buffalo? But they finally, you know, they changed that, right? And by the way, by the way, she said, uh, Lanny was asking, where are those things from? And people would say, California. She said, no, no, it, they are in California. Guess what? Well, you know where you can find a lot of them? Catalina Island. Did you know that? You can find a lot of them on Catalina Island. Now you say, how did they get to the island? There's a really funny story about how they got to the island. They were left there after somebody was making a Western movie. And, the, and the, uh, the bison just couldn't get, you know, they had a western going on, and so they were on the island, right? And so she had that big animal there, and I said, well, wasn't that wonderful? And we've been talking about how God uh, had Adam, right, name those animals. And animals uh, do different things. God is this creative God, and, and, and God uh, uh, formed these animals to do th- different things, right? Some run, some hop, some swim, some burrow, some fly. Each has a particular role. And based on the way they were shaped by God, that kind of helps you determine their role. So when you see a beaver, a beaver which making these dams, he has special claws in order to get some of that stuff right. He's got a special tail in order to pack that thing together, right? So, so the way he is shaped, the way he has certain tools about him or, or bird and the way their beak is. Some beaks are longer than others, right? Because they're, the way they eat and the way they hunt and the way they do things is for special purposes. God is awesome in that way. And he's done the same for us. We are shaped to serve God. It is why we are, each of us was uniquely designed and shaped to do certain things. Uh, we are created in Christ Jesus. Um, we are God's masterpiece. We are original. We are not made, we are not an assembly line product. Uh, so, you know, if you ever feel down, if you ever feel like you've got low self-esteem, you ought to come to the church because, or read the Word of God because the Word of God lets you know that you don't have to have low self-esteem because you are somebody. You are created. You are unique. You were not an afterthought. You were not mass-produced. You are custom-designed. Oh, isn't that good? You're one of a kind. I'm glad you're one of a kind. I'm glad I'm one of a kind too, right? We don't need two of me. Unique, original. Huh? Huh? That's why suicide is so tragic. Because when that person goes, there's no one else like them. Can you imagine God's heart when says, no, no, no. Or when murder takes place or homicide, no. Can't replace them. I don't care how many billions of people on the face of the earth. No two people are exactly alike, one of a kind, unique, original, masterpiece, works of art. Oh, I love the psalmist. He says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are complex individuals. Some of us more complex than others. <laughs> we are shaped for serving God. S-H-A-P-E. So one of the ways that, that God uh, deliberately shapes and forms us is to serve him in a way that makes uh, your ministry and your service unique. And so you should know that we are a combination of Many different factors. Tell you about the complexity of us, right? Now, remember, we're talking about what should I be doing? This is what we're talking about. What should I be doing? What you should be doing is serving. What should I be doing? Serving. But not just serving any kind of way. Serving according to the way God shaped you. Let me let that sink in for a minute. Serving in a way that God shaped you. Now, what are we talking about? We talked about being unique, complex individuals. Many different factors go into who you are. Many different factors go into who I am. Abilities, interests, talents, gifts, aspirations, personality, and life experiences. God uses all of this for his glory. All of this for his purpose. God uses everything that... Listen, I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this because we're going to go deeper into this just uh, don't have a lot of time left. We're going to go deeper into this in just a minute. God uses 
everything about us for his work and for his glory. God, I'm going to say it again. God uses everything about you. I love this part. This is, this is one of those, I know you guys don't get excited about this stuff because I do. God uses everything about you for ministry, for service, for his glory, for the advancement of his king. Everything about you. Wow. And we're going to see that. We're going to go deeper into this in just a minute, and we're going to use this. So this is an acrostic shape, and we're going we're to use that in a, in a minute, uh, this shape. And I'm gonna, I'll tell you what it is ahead of time, then we're going to come back. So S stands for spiritual gifts. S stands for what? Spiritual gifts. S stands for spiritual gifts. H stands for heart. H stands for what? Heart. Good. A stands for abilities. A stands for what? Abilities. P stands for personality. P stands for what? Personality. E stands for experiences. E stands for what? Experiences. And God uses our spiritual gifts, our heart passions, our abilities, our personality, and our experiences to bring him glory. This is what, this is what, and this is how we are shaped. So it's not just the, it is not just spiritual gifts. We must understand that you as a masterpiece, you created in Christ Jesus, you are God's gift. It's not just about spiritual gift. It's about giftedness. The person that is you is the gift to the world that God has given. You were born and you were gifted to the world. Once you say, Jesus, once you say, here I am, here I am, I am yours and you are mine, I'm willing to be used by you, you become the gift that God gives to a broken world. Boy, that's something else. It's not just Jesus. Jesus in you now becomes the Jesus to somebody else. In a broken world, you and I get that opportunity to be his hands and to be his feet and to be his voice. There's that song they used to sing, and, and I love that song. I haven't heard it too much uh, lately. It say, you may be the only Jesus some will ever see. Remember that song? It's an old song. You may be the only Jesus some will ever see. And you and I, beloved people of God, we are God's gift. Not only is it a responsibility, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. And God uses our spiritual gifts and our, our heart, our passions, and our abilities and our personality to be a gift to the world. So the first thing is as spiritual gifts, I, I'm going to go through this uh, quite quick, quickly. This is what your shape is. God gives every believer spiritual gifts to be used in a ministry. Spiritual gifts are special God-empowered abilities for serving him. They're only given to believers. You can't earn them. They are gifts of grace. You can't choose them. God is the one that determines them. Now, I do a seminar on this at, uh, at times. It's called Finding Your Fit in the Body of Christ. And we use this same thing, finding your fit in the body of Christ. Because people are always asking, man, how do I, what do I, yeah, what should I be doing? I'm not sure. I'm in this body, but I'm not sure what part uh, I should play. Um, God, God determines the gifts. He chooses them. He determines where the gifts should go because I usually ask this question, why do you think it is that God is the one that does that? And uh, the short answer to it, people give all kinds of answers. The short answer is God knows he has the plan. You don't always see the plan. He sees the big picture. So he gives gifts. He's a smart, he's a smart and wise God. He gives gifts according to what the purposes, his purposes and his plan. So that's why he's the one that gives the gifts out. No single gift is given to every person. No single gift is given to every person. God loves variety. No one individual receives all the gifts. Let me say that again, because there's some people who are in a community that think <clears throat> they've got all the gifts. Well, no, they don't have all the gifts, and I'm glad they don't have all the gifts. You know why? Because if you had them all, you wouldn't need anybody else. You would do everything. You would do everything. 
And so that's why God gives the body. He gives members of the body those gifts. And so that we can be, we talked about this last night, remember, that we're not codependent. Thank you for that. We are not independent. We are interdependent. If that makes sense, let me hear you say man out there. I think I lost you. Yeah? Okay. Makes us interdependent. Um, you find that in 1 Corinthians 12, right? The I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because you can just sit there being an eye and the hand is out here and you won't get anything done. You can see, but that's it. Right? Interdependent. So the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, gives severally as he wills so that we put our gifts together and together we make an impact. Not isolated, together we make an impact. And these uh, spiritual gifts, you find them, these are the main, you can write these down, these are the main passages of the Bible where you find spiritual gifts. Uh, we spent some time, right, in 1 Corinthians 12, we talked a little bit about Ephesians 4. They're also in Romans 12. Now, I want to tell you there are a number of different gifts there. I won't take the time to read them all because you can read and you should go back and read them. I want to say this, though, about those gifts. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just giving you an idea of the variety of gifts that there are. And it's so funny to, to study uh, this gift. It's so great to study what these gifts do and that the Holy Spirit gives them to us. So that's spiritual gifts. We were saying God uses everything in us. He shapes us. The next is H for heart. It's what? Heart. Yes, H for heart. And heart, we're talking about passion. We're talking about passion. Here's some texts from the Bible that, that tell us what we mean by heart, okay? Uh, Deuteronomy 11, verse 13 from the New American Standard Bible says, And it shall come about, if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Does that sound familiar? Have we seen a text like that before? Yeah. Do you remember when Jesus was answering that expert in the law? For those of you who have been here during the week, he answered that expert in the law and they said, what are the, what's the greatest commandments? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Jesus was quoting the only known scriptures at that time. Because there wasn't a New Testament, it was just the scriptures. It was after the New Testament was written that we broke them up between Old Testament and New Testament. And he's quoting from Deuteronomy. Love your God and serve him with all your heart. With all your heart. Ephesians, now here's the New Testament. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you. This is Paul talking to believers. He says, uh, don't, don't just do good work when, when people are looking uh, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, from your heart. So the Bible uses the term heart to describe the, the, the bundle of desires and hopes and interests and ambitions and dreams and affections we have. What you love to do and what you care about most um, is your passion. It is your heart. And have you ever discovered that people don't have the same interests? You probably discovered that in your own house, right? People have different interests. They have different interests. They have different desires. They have different goals in mind. That is the heart. That is the passion. And God uses that variety of gifts and that variety of passions. The next is abilities. It's what? Abilities. God also uses abilities. Now, what are abilities? Abilities are those natural talents you're born with or acquired skills, okay, or acquired skills. So everyone doesn't sing like Melody, right? Because there's some people that they say can't hold a tune in a bucket, right? Don't look at me when I said that, okay? So every, I mean, that's a gift. That's a talent, right? Natural, natural talent. Her mom named her Melody. <laughs> you think that might have something to do with it? I don't know. Maybe she was singing in the womb. I don't know, Right? But it was probably very natural. I had a nephew, I remember, he was just two years old, and no one taught him this, but he knew how to throw a ball at two years old. Just could, better than I could. I mean, just natural talents, right? Natural talents, they're natural abilities. But some also are acquired skill sets, things that we've learned. Maybe somebody has taught us a trade. Somebody has taught us 
natural abilities. You see that in Exodus chapter 31, verses 33 through 5, when they were building the, they were building the temple. And look, God says, I have filled them with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge, with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze to cut stone. God gave them the skills. So really, it's a fine line, isn't it, between spiritual gifts and some of these skills that we have. But God uses these as well, these skills and these talents. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. So what I should be doing is the things that glorify God. That's what I should be doing. All kind of abilities can be used for glorifying God. And there are abilities in of this place today. In fact, let me just kind of see. Uh, there are all kinds of things that people can do. So I want to just kind of hear from those who were what kind of special skill that do you have that is just your talent? It's just your talent. Let me just kind of hear. We know singing. What else is out there? Welding. Wow. I can't weld. Okay. I know it's hard. What else? Finance. Finance or accounting or bookkeeping. That is a skill that I also don't have. Okay. What else? Computer repair. Computer repair. Yes, absolutely. Can you talk to me after the Sabbath? Okay, good. All right. What else is out there? What other skills are there? Huh? Math? Oh, mathematics. Oh, yes, yes. That is a skill, and you can use that for a number of different things. Uh, yeah, that's, all, that's the son of the computer guy that can fix. Yeah, that makes sense. Other skills that are out there? Skills. Teaching is a skill. And it can also be a gift, right? What else? Counseling. counseling is a skill. Yes. Counseling is a skill. What's your rate? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, what else? Huh? Climbing a, tree. Climbing a tree. Yeah. I had to stop that for a while. Yeah. Climbing a tree. What's another skill? Look at all these skills out there. These abilities. What else? Huh? Listening, Listening is a skill. That my wife will tell you I'm struggling with. Okay, yeah. Huh? Caregiving. Caregiving. Yes. Mowing the lawn. Mowing the lawn. lawn. That is so true. You should see my lawn. Anyway, uh, mowing the lawn is a skill. It is a skill that I'm learning to acquire. Um, Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Do you think that everything we called out can be used for God's glory? Yes. Yes. And that's why God takes everything that is us and uses it for his glory. All right. The next one is P. P stands for personality. P stands for what? Personality. Each of us has original and unique. God broke the mold when he made you. He created each of us with a unique combination of personality traits, didn't he? If you, have you ever heard of Myers-Briggs? Some of you know Myers-Briggs, right? Uh, you know, ENTJ or some of the other different things. There's so many personality tests. There's uh, the DISC test. There's uh, all these personality tests. And uh, it's just a combination of things. And so there are all kinds of people, right? Introverts and extroverts and thinkers or feelers or being sanguine or choleric or melancholy or phlegmatic, all can be used for the glory of God. And the Bible actually gives us many examples of how God uses different personality types for his work. You can think of some. Peter was sanguine. Paul was a choleric. Jeremiah was melancholic. He was kind of, you know, he was down a lot. And think about those 12 disciples They had some personalities, didn't they? And that's why they had some personality conflicts, right? But God uses all kinds of personalities. There is no right or wrong kind of personality. All personalities can be used by God for his glory. If that makes sense, let me hear you say amen out there. There's no excuse. Every person, every person, introvert, extrovert, no matter what you are, can be used in the work of God. For his glory, he uses all types. Thank you, Jesus. He uses all types for his glory. And then lastly, experiences. So we talked about spiritual gifts. 
We talked about H being the heart for passion, your interests, your desires, your, your things you like to do. That's used for the glory of God. God uses those passions, those things you're into. And, and then God takes those A, those abilities. We talked about all those skills. You told me he can use all those skills. We talked about personality. We all have different kinds of personalities, right? Uh, and God uses every kind of personality. God also uses our experiences, our experiences. He leaves nothing to waste. You and I have been shaped by many different experiences. Some experiences are great, some not so good, some horrible. Right? And God is so awesome, he can even take the worst mess and turn it into a message. You know how I know that? Look at, ex- uh, not Exodus, look at Genesis chapter 50. Right at the end, if you know that story, Joseph had been in prison, Joseph had been sold out, Joseph had been neglected, Joseph had been abused, Joseph had been accused, everything that happened to Joseph. I mean, imagine getting betrayed by your brothers, thrown into a pit, in a prison, all of that. And Joseph, at the end of that traumatic experience, because I don't know about you, but if I'm incarcerated, it's trauma. It's trauma. You lock me up, I'm going crazy. Traumatic experience. Can you imagine him being thrown in that pit, sitting there wondering, are they ever coming back for me? Is this, is, is this it? Is this my life? Is this the way it ends? I'm only, he's a young man. I don't think at that point he was, he was a teenager, early teen, 12, 13, in a pit by his brothers. Traumatic. But you get to Genesis chapter 50, and his brothers, now he's, he's, he's prime minister now in Egypt. He has arrived. He's made it. I mean, if it was a Hollywood movie, it was like, here comes the vengeance scene. Right? Hollywood would be like, he's going to get them now. And they were worried about that, right? Those brothers, and they said, oh, my goodness, our father has died. Joseph is going to, he was waiting. He was waiting until our dad died. Now he's going to exact revenge on us. And Joseph, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 50, he said, he said to them, don't worry about it. You meant it for evil. Is that what he said? He said, you meant it for evil. There are things that have happened to you out there. I know some of you out there. The devil, God didn't do that to you. The devil meant it for evil. Somebody in here may have been abused. The devil meant it for evil. Somebody was probably lied on. Somebody was probably tricked. Somebody was stolen from. The devil meant it for evil. But he said, God has taken the evil and worked it out for the good. Ooh, I'm going to shout by myself, folks. Just give me a moment, okay? Huh? Because you, you, you're, not, you're, not, you're not with me on that one. The devil meant it for evil. But God could flip the script. And he used that evil to bring about your good. So anything that comes at you, God can turn that thing around. I want to tell you now, God is God. That's one of the things that makes God God to me. God could take the evil in circumstances of my situation and turn it around for his glory. And Joseph said, because it was to save many lives. So therefore, even bad experiences that we have can be ministry opportunities. You know, some of the best ministries that are out there that are reaching people. And I'm trying not to look at my friend over here. I think his name is Scott, who's had a situation because of his experience is able to reach people. In, right? Am I right, Scott? You're able to reach people because of your experience like theirs and has his own ministry to reach people that have the experience that he's had. That's what I'm talking about. And some of the best ministries are not theoretical. They're because I have been through the experience, so I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I've been where you've been. Some people have been addicted. I've been where you've been, right? Some people are, are, have been abused, and you can say, I've been where you've been. Some people have depressed, and they can say to somebody else who's depressed, I've been where you've been. I know it's dark. Sometimes it doesn't seem, think you can't get out of bed, but just know I've been where you've been. And you just have to take one step after the next. I've been where you've been. And God uses those experiences to bring about his glory. He 
He uses them to do ministry. Nothing's wasted. I'm going to move past this next slide. It just tells you all the different kinds of experiences they are. But God uses our painful experiences the most. So you may be wondering, somebody who's out there today, you're saying, I don't know, why me? Why did that happen to me? Because the devil meant it for evil. Why did, why did I have those parents? Why did I have that father? The devil meant it for evil. Why do I have that addiction? The devil meant it for evil. Why did they do that to me? The devil meant it for evil. But God can take the pain. He can take the scars. He can take the wounds. I'm talking to somebody today. Listen to me. He can take the wounds. He can take the disappointments. He can take the troubled at times and dark experiences. He can take that hopelessness. He can take the despair. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. And he can use it for his glory. It might make you a better preacher. It might make you a better teacher. It might make you a better doctor. It might make you a better lawyer. It might make you a better computer technologist. He takes our experiences and uses them for his glory. And we are shaped. We are shaped for serving God. You and I were shaped for serving God. Those gifts, the desires, the abilities, the personality, the experiences. You were shaped to serve. You are God's gift to a broken world. Wants to use you. You can't sit back on that. You you can't you can't you can't say oh I, I'm just here to just sit in a pew. No. No. When we do this on Saturdays, we do this on Sabbath. This is just if 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 you can excuse my football analogy here. This is just the huddle. Huh. Oh, come on, somebody talk to me. When we come together like this, this is not the end all. This is just the huddle. There's a play that's going to run. There's a game that's going on. And it's a game of life and death. This is the huddle. Don't get stuck in the huddle. Because you know what? If you get stuck in the huddle, they blow the whistle and they say delay of game. Oh, boy, I'm going to say amen to myself on that one. I'm going to say amen to myself on that one. Uh, if we say, oh, that was good. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I got to write that one down. Hold on a second. I got to, whoo, I got to write the lay of game. That's what I think. I finally figured out what's wrong with some of our churches. We delayed a game. We're stuck in the huddle. It's time that we're in the huddle now. We sing our praises. We sing our songs. We do the children's story. We say, yeah, wonderful. We get a good message and then go out and get in the game. That's what God is calling us to, to get in that game and do a work for him. Oh, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. I'm going to make a very simple appeal for you today. It is simply this. You're asking the question, yeah, now that I'm in Christ. Yes, now that I want to be in his body of believers. Yes, uh, yes, I know that I'm becoming more and more like Jesus. And, and I, I'm, I'm in community. I'm here. I'm born to belong. And yes, I know those things. And yes, now I ask the question, what should I be doing? And I realize God has shaped me for this moment in earth's history. For this time, God, thank you. And you're saying, God, here I am. I want to appeal to you. Has God shaped you? Oh, what variety is in this room? You're saying, I'm in the huddle, but I'm ready to get in the game. I'm ready to call the play. I'm ready to make an impact for Jesus Christ. He's shaped me for it. Oh, as the melody comes and sings this song, this final 
appeal I want to make to you. Is that your desire today to say, God, you've shaped me. I'm not going to just stay in the huddle. I'm going to get in the game. I'm going to move forward with my, the gifts that I, I don't even know what the gifts are yet that I've got, but I'm going to discover them. I'm going to use them. I know I've got some desires. I've got some passions and some things I'd be interested in. Uh, God, you've gifted me. You've given me abilities and skills of all kinds. You, you, you give me a, a very unique personality and and I'm going to use that for you, God, too, wherever you want to use me. And, and, and there's some experiences, good and bad, that I've had, but you can use those too. God, here I am. If that's your desire, as we're singing this song, if, if you wouldn't mind, some of you may be too long for you to stay. Would you, if that's your commitment, you, that you're saying, God, I want to be your gift that you have given to a broken world. Would you stand with me? Would you stand? Would you make that kind of commitment to say, I, some I have a little bit, some I have a lot, but I'm going to use it for your glory just as I am without one plea. I'm going to use it for your God. Whatever it is, I'm going to use it for your glory, God, to do your work. Thank you, Jesus. Melanie, sing that song for us.
about your eyes are closed we're standing in the very presence of God we are his people we are the sheep of his pasture he is the great shepherd he's called us into community together today we're part of this huddle oh but he's got a plan he's got a play to call and it's for each of us to at least reach one. If you wouldn't mind, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Can I just make one last appeal to you today? It is Jesus that when he was leaving on this earth, when he was leaving his disciples behind, he said, go. and Make disciples of all people. Go and make disciples of all people, everywhere. Jesus was saying to us tonight, disciples, down through the ages, down through the centuries, go and reach at least one. So the second part of this appeal is just to simply ask, you've heard this song sung so beautifully. It was an appeal to you. This is going to take some courage now to do this. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. You just pray somebody today. Be praying. You're saying, I can't keep this good news, this way of life to myself. I can't just always just take all the blessings on to myself. I am willing, as I'm standing here, by God's grace, to at least... Share what I know with one person. I'll share what I know. Maybe my experience, maybe my desires, maybe my passions, maybe my gifts. I will share the love and the good news of Jesus Christ with at least one person. That means you have to know everything. Just what you, what you know, what your experience. Can you make that commitment today? You make that commitment just by raising your hand, saying, I, by God's grace, at least one person. And maybe God has to lead you to who that one person is. By God's grace, one person. I'm willing to share this with at least one. Father, as we close as we pray. May your, may your spirit fall upon us. Thank you so much that we've got a better glimpse of our purpose. Thank you so much that we've got a better sense of who we are and whose we are in you. Oh God, you sent your son, your only son, Jesus Christ, who died on a broken and cruel cross. He did it that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. And oh God, now we ask that you would fill us with your spirit. 
Give us the courage. Give us what we need to share this message and not keep it to ourselves with at least one person. And then one person shares it with another person and one person shares it with another person. And, and before we know it, God, your kingdom is filling up. That's what you're looking for. You're coming back for a people without spot or rigor. You're coming back for a people that have the face of Jesus. And we want to be able to say on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him through the terrible, chaotic times. We waited for him through the storms of life. And he has now come to take us home with him and to save us. Father, commit these decisions today. I can uh, seal these decisions today in every heart. In the worthy name of Jesus, we pray. Let the redeemed people of God together say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're not letting you go anywhere just yet, Doc. <laughs> We're not going to let you and Melody walk out of this place without us as a church saying thank you. How many people want to say thank you to Dr. Woodson and Melody today? We've been blessed. And today, this morning, was truly a grand finale, Doc. Thank you very much. Melody, thank you for that beautiful appeal song. Uh, we know you don't live too far from here. So make sure you come back now, yeah? <laughs> God bless you. Dr. Woodson, if you didn't know he's our conference president, I want to have a word of prayer with you. You have a lot to do, and we're grateful that you're here. Lord, I, thank, I'm, I want to thank you for Dr. Woodson. And I pray, God, that we would continue to lift him up of the others in the conference, and I pray that your blessing would be upon him as he carries and he juggles many different things. Bless him and Marlene. Thank you for bringing him this way. Bring him back soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, and be a blessing to someone. Amen.